To be inducted into a group of people in any walk of life is to be considered one of them. It's a sign that you belong and that, whenever need be, they'll have your back. Of course, in wrestling, this is more important than almost anywhere else, as with rivals always vying to take you down, you really need backup. But what happens when someone isn't able to make that membership full and instead has to settle on it being partial? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. So join us as we take a deep dive into Conditional Friends, Wrestling's Honorary Faction Members. And if we're going to start anywhere, we really should start with an example which has led to probably the best thing going in WWE today, and that's Sami Zayn and his Honorary Oos membership with The Bloodline. Yes, if Vince McMahon did one thing right during his final days in power, it was to let the French-Canadian star start courting the affections of Roman Reigns and the rest of his crew beginning in April of 2022. But while the bloodline were at first hesitant to let Sammy into the fold, over time, his naive charms won over not only Jimmy Uso and Paul Heyman, but even the tribal chief, too. And when Solo Sokoa came on board later that summer, it even seemed like he had a soft spot for the former Intercontinental Champion. That said, one person who was not convinced of Zayn's good intentions was Jay Uso, as over the course of the storyline, he'd repeatedly show his distaste for the honorary Us, claiming that he wasn't one of the family and as such couldn't be trusted. Of course, as the months have gone on, even Jay has begun to soften. But then how could he not when his adopted cousin has given fans some of the best WWE segments in recent memory? with perhaps none of these being better than the now-famous Feeling Usy segment on the October 28th episode of SmackDown, where he got the entire bloodline to break character as they desperately tried not to laugh in the middle of the ring. And as if that wasn't enough to make Jay finally fall in love with Sammy, the fact that he helped his stable to win at War Games just a few weeks later would only solidify his spot as honorary member of the bloodline. But while things look rosy for the crew now, it's hard to say where the future will lie for Sammy Uso, given the fact that his storyline is still ongoing at the time of this video's recording. Will he remain an Uso for the foreseeable future, or will he, as many people expect, be turned on by the group and side with Kevin Owens instead during the lead-up to WrestleMania? We'll just have to wait and see, something we don't have to do for our next entry. Because when it comes to Sami Zayn's real-life best friend, KO, his time with the New Day in 2019 was always going to come to a quick and violent end. After all, if there's one thing you can say about Owens' character, it's that he doesn't keep friends for long. And the reason for this is usually because, at a certain point, he'll let his true villainous side show when he turns on them and leaves them for dead. It happened with Chris Jericho, and it's happened numerous times with Sami Zayn over the years, so really, the New Day have only got themselves to blame for inviting him into the fold at all then. But ever the fun-loving and trusting babyfaces, Kofi Kingston, Big E, and Xavier Woods would do just this in April of that year, when KO tried to turn over a new leaf by congratulating the Ghanaian-born star on winning the WWE title at WrestleMania 35. And this would even see him become an honorary member of the New Day for a few weeks after that as he came down to the ring with the rest of the crew and even dressed himself in similar gear. That was until the April 23rd episode of SmackDown, however, because here, Owens would turn on Kofi and the rest of his new friends, revealing what his plan had been all along at this point. And what had this plan been? Well, after Kofi Mania caught fire and Kingston had usurped KO's spot in the WWE title match with Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania, the Canadian had decided the best way to get even was to lure the new champ into a false sense of security, then pounce on him when he was least expecting it. Of course, to rub salt to the wound even more, after this was done, he'd attempt to take the WWE title away from the babyface at the following month's pay-per-view, Money in the Bank. That said, he would ultimately fail to do this, causing all his months of planning to come to nothing. But plotting to infiltrate a stable from the inside hasn't always failed in WWE. No, in fact, just a few years prior to this, it had worked like a charm. What example are we talking about here? Why, the time Daniel Bryan joined the Wyatt family, of course. Now, we should point out that there are two levels of reality to this entry. As in kayfabe, the story was that the American Dragon had been targeted by Bray Wyatt and his cronies in late 2013, with the cult stable hoping to brainwash Bryan and make him one of their own. 
But while fans remained behind their hero throughout his struggles here, at a certain point, it seemed like the former Ring of Honor World Champion had indeed succumbed to Bray's silver tongue, as at the turn of the year, he joined forces with the heels, with him even taking to wearing new gear and briefly renaming himself Daniel Wyatt. Of course, while live audiences were not happy about this, when they realized it was all a ruse so that Brian could get Wyatt alone in a cage a few weeks later, they were overjoyed, and as the American Dragon proceeded to lay out his captor then, they'd rain down yes chants on him. That said, for as logical as this all appeared to be in kayfabe, the other layer to this story is that in truth, the Daniel Wyatt angle had been done specifically because Vince McMahon wanted fans to stop cheering for Brian. Yes, this was the point where, rather than going with the Yes movement, the boss was still trying to push an upcoming WrestleMania main event nobody wanted to see, featuring Batista and Randy Orton. Luckily though, after a basketball game featuring the crowd doing the Yes chant went viral soon thereafter, he'd see the error of his ways and quickly turn his hottest star babyface once more, using the logic that he had been luring Bray in all along so as to get around this. Back in the old days though, Vince would never have needed to do this for the most part because, with that being the period where he was still considered a great booker, his storylines generally made sense and followed what fans wanted to see. And in 1998, right when the WWF was about to explode into the mainstream once more with the Attitude Era, there were few things fans wanted to see more than the Ultimate Rebel Group D-Generation X be paired up with boxing's ultimate bad boy, Mike Tyson. That's right, after spending the 90s either in prison or banned from boxing outright after biting off the ear of Evander Holyfield in the middle of a fight, Iron Mike would be forced to look elsewhere for work for a while. And this would lead to him sitting down with Vince McMahon in late 1997, as the two began hashing out plans to bring the former unified world champion in for the following year's WrestleMania. So when Tyson agreed to do this soon thereafter, the only question became, how would he be used? Luckily for everyone then, there was a perfect entry point for him at this point, as with D-Generation X ruling the roost on Raw and Stone Cold Steve Austin nipping at the heels of Shawn Michaels in his WWF title, it only made sense to get Iron Mike involved in the fun. Of course, that would see him first appear on January 19, 1998, only to quickly come to blows with the rattlesnake and give the company a huge amount of mainstream press in the process. And following this, apparently upset with how Austin had disrespected him, Iron Mike would align himself with DX, claiming that they were the only people he could get behind, as they were rebels just like him. In the end, however, this would all prove to be short-lived as, at WrestleMania 14 a couple of months later, Tyson would count the winning fall for Stone Cold, then lay out HBK with a single punch, solidifying his last-minute turn to the side of the good guys with this. And when asked why he had a change of heart after the fact, he'd revealed that he'd only been pretending to be on the side of DX, as the real rebel of WWF going forward was Steve Austin and Steve Austin alone. But DX weren't the only branch of the clique who were getting celebrities involved during the late 90s because while Shawn Michaels and Triple H were bringing in one of boxing's greatest legends for a run up in New York, down in Atlanta, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall were using their sway in World Championship Wrestling to get Dennis Rodman to join forces with the NWO. And yes, anyone who has a passing knowledge of basketball will know that, in the 90s, there were few bigger stars in the sport than Rodman. And that was because, aside from being one of the star players of the Chicago Bulls during this time period, he'd also become a pop culture phenomenon on account of his wild rock and roll tinged personal life. So with the NWO being the coolest faction in all of wrestling, and with Hulk Hogan serving as its figurehead, it was easy for WCW to get a foot in the door with the basketball star in 1997 and, from there, arrange to bring him in as an honorary member of the stable in March of that year. But this wasn't a case where he'd just be standing there on the sidelines and cheering the rest of the group on. No, Robin would actually get in the ring himself on more than one occasion, with the most memorable of these probably being the time he teamed with the Hulkster to take on Diamond Dallas Page and Utah Jazz star Carl Malone in a tag team bout. And even after that, Dennis would continue to wear his honorary NWO membership as a badge of pride, so much so that, decades later, he's still listed as being NWO for life whenever he appears as a guest on news and sports programs. But for as much of an honor as it was for him to become a member of wrestling's ultimate den of thieves, even that couldn't match up to how big of a deal it was for an outsider to be inducted into the Hart family, albeit only in an honorary sense. And so that was why, when Brian Pillman became a member of the Hart Foundation in 1997, it marked something of a career high point for the loose cannon. How did this happen, though? 
After all, it made sense for the other four members of the stable to be part of things, as with Brett and Owen being the sons of Stu Hart, and Davy Boy Smith and Jim Neidhart being married to two of Stu's daughters, their inclusion was obvious. When it came to Pillman, though, he had no direct family connection to the Hart family, either by blood or by marriage. That said, what he did have was a period during his youth where he'd trained under the patriarch of the clan in the famous Hart family dungeon. And sure, he was far from the only person to do this. No, arguably even bigger stars like Chris Jericho, Chris Benoit, Roddy Piper, or Jake Roberts had done time in the dungeon too. But what they didn't have, which Pillman did, was such a strong friendship with the other four members of the Hart Foundation. So strong that he'd be invited to join the stable as an honorary family member when they reformed as a heel act in the spring of that year. So not willing to waste the opportunity which had been given to him then, Pillman would stand by his new family side throughout the next few months as he helped them to go to war with the rest of the babyface roster. And even when the Hearts turned their back on the U.S. and remains true to only the Great White North, the loose cannon would follow them, seemingly rejecting his American allegiances in the process. Hell, even prior friendships couldn't make him turn his back on Brett and co, because when Steve Austin got into a program with both Brett and Owen, Pillman would continue to side with the Hearts, despite the fact that he and the Rattlesnake had been real-life best friends for a time prior, as well as tag team partners in WCW as the Hollywood Blondes. Unfortunately, though, before the story of Brian Pillman and the Hart Foundation could reach its peak, tragedy would strike, when in October of 1997, he'd be found dead in his hotel room a victim of an apparent heart attack. That said, even if he was taken before his time, the Hearts have continued to treat him as an honorary member of the family in the years since, with Brett to this day still considering him to be a brother from another mother. But what happens when a temporary stablemate's position in the group has nothing to do with family ties or even friendship for that matter? What happens instead when it's illness which necessitates an allegiance? Well, if you want to find out the answer to this, you only have to look to a prime example which occurred in October of 2017 when, for one night only, Kurt Angle became a member of The Shield. How did this one come about, though? Well, well, it was supposed to be Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins teaming up with Roman Reigns to take on the union of The Miz, Braun Strowman, Kane, Sheamus, and Cesaro at that night's Tables, Ladders, and Chairs pay-per-view. Due to him contracting the mumps in the days leading up to the show, the big dog would have to be pulled at the last minute. And while this did put a damper on what was then being hyped up as the long-awaited reunion of the Hounds of Justice, at least fans in attendance were able to get something of a consolation prize because, after subbing in at the last minute, Kurt Angle would compete in a WWE ring for the first time in 11 years. Yes, after having spent the last decade working for TNA, Angle would have only recently returned to Vince McMahon's promotion in an authority figure role earlier that spring. And while the plan was always to build him up to teaming with Ronda Rousey at WrestleMania 34, a spanner would be thrown into the works when he was required to make his comeback on only a couple of days' notice instead. So that was how, at the TLC show, a truly bizarre sight would take place, which saw Angle coming out through the crowd in full riot gear equipment, being flanked by Ambrose and Rollins, and looking like a middle-aged dad trying his best to seem cool around his kids. Of course, once he hit the ring after that, he proved he still had what it took to carry himself in a match. And that was partially why, by the end of this one, he'd be standing tall with his temporary Shield brothers after having scored the winning pinfall. Following this then, his final in-ring run would continue, as over the next couple of years, he'd have one last hurrah before finally retiring altogether at WrestleMania 35. And to think, had he not proven he could still go while in the ring with two of the best young talents in the industry that night in October of 2017, he may never have had the confidence to keep going for as long as he did. When it comes to our next entry, though, it wasn't his in-ring skills which earned him an honorary spot in one of the most legendary stables in WWE history. No, in the case of Hornswoggle's run with D-Generation X, it was more because he could act as the mascot during their PG period. Yes, Mike Tyson isn't the only person who's been given honorary membership into DX over the years, though when he was part of the group, they were far edgier in their nature. But this was to be expected given the time period the world was in at that point. And it was also to be expected that once Shawn Michaels and Triple H reunited in the mid-2000s, the changing times and their increased age would necessitate things being different. So realizing this, the degenerates would take things in a far more child-friendly direction this time around, and part of the way they did so was to get their own bona fide mascot in the form of Hornswoggle. That's right, in 2009, right at the point the DX revival was running out of steam, some new blood would be added to the act when, 
After he decided he wanted to be a member of the group, the diminutive star would decide to make himself an honorary degenerate. Of course, this didn't go down well with HBK in the game at first, feeling like they should have a final say on who was and wasn't in the group. They'd take umbrage with Hornswoggle's self-inflicted inclusion and would serve him legal papers, informing him not to wear their merchandise in the future. So in order to get revenge over this, the would-be mascot was able to convince those in power to pit the two teammates against each other when they took on John Cena in a triple threat match at that November Survivor Series. And in the end, it was this rebellious streak which caused the two former world champions to see that they'd been wrong about their would-be partner all along. So that was why, by the end of the year, he'd have been made an official associate of the group, with him not only getting a chance to team up with them during a six-man tag against The Big Show, The Miz, and Napoleon Dynamite star John Heater, but also getting to score the winning pinfall over Heater during this bout. Then after scoring this big win for his team, the former Cruiserweight champion would end up staying by Triple H and Shawn Michaels' side all the way up to the point that he was drafted over to SmackDown and there left to go it on his own again. But that wouldn't be the only time Hornswoggle found himself in the position of being an honorary member of a well-known faction in WWE. No, years after this, in fact, in 2014, he'd do it all over again when, instead of becoming an unofficial member of DX, he'd become a close ally to 3MB. And yes, we realize 3MB were hardly as decorated of a group as his prior one was, but this aside, with them being one of the best comedy jobber acts the company had seen in years at that point, it gave Hornswoggle plenty of opportunity to bring the laughs again. After all, it's what he did best, and it was certainly what he did here because after aligning himself with the trio of Heath Slater, Jinder Mahal, and Drew McIntyre on April 15th of this year, turning heel for the first time since 2007 in the process, the former Cruiserweight champion would get to represent his team in one of the best and most underrated comedy matches of all time. What match was that? Well, it was the WLC bout, of course one which took place at the following month's Extreme Rules pre-show and saw Hornswoggle take on fellow little person El Torito. Of course here, rather than using full-size ladders to try and grab a belt hanging from above the ring, the whole thing would be played more for comedy, as instead, tiny step ladders, chairs, and tables were used, and lots of very safe-looking six-inch-from-the-ground bumps were taken as a result. That said, by the end of this one, it would be El Torito who came out on top, and as a result of the loss, Hornswoggle's time with 3MB would draw to a close soon thereafter. Still though, he must have done something to inspire them during his short time as part of the stable, because in the years which followed this, Drew McIntyre and Jinder Mahal would go on to become WWE Champion. When it comes to Heath Slater though, he's remained in the position of undercard comedy jobber, a role which he plays better than almost anyone in wrestling today, to be fair. But if he has a female counterpart in this spot, it would likely be our next subject of today, because while she may have peaked as a member of the Iconics, even after she went solo and became an honorary member of the Riot Squad, Billy Kay could always be relied on to make people giggle. She would need that though, as at the beginning of 2021, with her no longer having her real-life best friend Peyton Royce to fall back on, she'd have struggled otherwise, given the fact that her skills were always more on the mic than in the ring. So realizing this, the Australian would develop a new character which saw her play things up for laughs by interrupting the Riot Squad segments week in and week out, all in the hopes that eventually she'd be able to convince them to let her join. And in the end, despite initially being hesitant to include her on account of her previous heelish ways, after Kay helped the group to score a victory over Natalia and Tamina in January of that year, Ruby Riot and Liv Morgan would begin to soften towards her. So much would they soften towards her, in fact, that as the weeks went on, Billy would seemingly be accepted into the Riot Squad, albeit on a purely probationary basis. Yes, even after she'd helped them out, Riot and co. were hesitant to trust their new stablemate fully, a hesitance which proved to be smart come April, as by then, Billy would have turned back to the dark side and aligned herself with Carmella. Less than a month following that, however, she'd be cut from her contract as part of a mass wave of releases, with her from there being forced to return to the Indies, where she could finally reunite with Peyton Royce. So perhaps there's a lesson to be learned here then, because even if your honorary membership at a stable doesn't last, you can always recover and find your feet again somewhere else. And perhaps anyone in this position should be preparing for such an eventuality, as being only a partial member of a group is never really destined to last forever. That said, we hope this isn't the case for Sami Zayn, because it'll break our heart to see him no longer getting to be Usi every week with the bloodline. He's just too good in the role to stop.